like the Goonies up here. It's pretty tight. But I've never been up there. Alright, come on up. Whoa! This is exactly like the Goonies. Yeah, they're videotapes. Whoa, is that a scrapbook? Yeah. Careful with it. Careful, it's old. Sorry. Yeah, we didn't have a lot of money when I was a kid, but I got to go to one game, and uh, I made a whole scrapbook out of it. What year was it? May 15th, 1993. Check this out. I was able to sneak down and take that picture, and I blew it up. It's right there. See? Well, why? Because it looks at me. I, I took that. That's Michael Jordan. Whoa! Yeah, no, I, I didn't catch that. Yeah, I was able to sneak down and get that, and then see that picture. Uh huh. I thought that picture was. Wait, that looks like the guy from the movie Mato Lulu's Translator. Oh, Luther the Anger Translator. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you're not supposed to have seen that, but okay. But look at this. See? I blew it up. I guess Michael Jordan did look like Luther the Anger Translator. I never thought about that. Yeah. Um, Why do you have a towel? It's very special. This is, <laughs> this is Michael Jordan's towel. Why do you have it? Um, I was in the locker room, and uh, he left it. Took it. Why'd you take it? Because it's Michael Jordan. He's like 25 years old. Just, just, okay, it's a little weird. I I, I admit. Um, How did you get into the locker room? Are these CDs? No, these are uh, videotapes. Uh, I was in radio and I got a press pass. And um, th these are the video I took when I met Jordan. You met Jordan? Yeah. Can we watch him? Uh, yeah. I guess it should still work. Why is this so shaky? I was nervous. It was Michael Jordan. I had never used this camera before, man. I bought it. Um, I bought it that morning, so I didn't know how any of this stuff worked. No idea. I just bought it that morning. <laughs> before this, me and that reporter and that other guy was Quinn Buckner. We were just hanging out, talking like it was totally normal. But I couldn't record that. I actually shouldn't even have been really recording this, but I did. Oh wait, you should hear this. Jordan's talking about Shaq. The hot chip guy? Yes, the hot chip guy. Ah. Closest to being a post up series, I have to get really remain dominant in the center. Sure. That's going to work because Scott and Anderson are part of what All those puzzle. guys you can just move around in different pieces of puzzle with hearts. Why did they kind of go away? Uh, it, was a, it was a setting on a camera. And just turn it like this, and it could uh, do black and white. I thought black and white looked kind of cool. I, I did some color stuff too. Yeah. Huh? Will they step forward and, and, and see that I do I don't have any reason to think that I But you never say never.
They talk about the Lakers here. Yeah, we did okay, boy. Eight teams next year that have between seven and eight, you know, at least seven losers. If Shaq signs first seven and eight million, it's not going to be enough. <laughs> You know, it's going to be one guy to set the mark. The Lakers, Lakers are going to have, they renounce Elvin, which they'll do, so they'll have no slots. They'll have 9.3. So Miami, that's just guys coming Miami's out. right there, too. Yeah. Miami's right at 10. Yeah. You're right at 10. Yeah, can I come up? Yeah. Hey, Cam, look, Pippen likes Gatorade, too. Who's Pippen? I have failed you. Are these basketball cards? Yeah. I, uh, I bought every single basketball card I could afford when I was a kid. Pretty, right? Yeah. When you don't live in an NBA city, you gravitate towards anything that can make you feel like you're there. And when you're from Columbus, Ohio, there are Buckeye fans and only Buckeye fans, because we all just felt sorry for Cleveland. So I adopted the Chicago Bulls when I was nine simply because the Chicago Bears won the Super Bowl that year, which means I lucked into following Jordan right as he began to explode. I was also lucky enough to be taping the night Jordan scored 69, and my father and I edited a highlight reel using two VCRs and ended up doing that for every game I could tape. And magazines. My goodness, the magazine covers. I read them, cut out some pictures, and I'd get an extra copy to save, like giant basketball cards. We tend to forget that before HD broadcasts and TVs the size of your wall, these types of images were like gold. You'd see magazine spreads on a game you had watched and think, wow, that's what it would be like if I was ever able to sit that close, knowing you surely would never get that access. But for a few moments flipping through those pages, you did. And then when Jordan retired, I was absolutely crushed, which made what came next even more spectacular. The return. Because now I was an adult. I was out of the house. So if I wanted to spend $300 for a pair of nosebleeds to see Jordan's return to Cleveland in April of 95, no one could stop me. And of course, it added to my scrapbook. And then two months later, my life changed forever when I became the youngest talk show host ever hired at 610 WTVN. Weekend on the Giant with Adam Contras. The full service Giant, 610 WTVN. Columbus. Middle of the night and you can't get to sleep. Turn the radio to TV. You hear a sort of club where members don't count Cheap and figure this is more fun than you'd have in bed Yes, it's the sad truth, folks Don't call we got an answer Yeah, are they all animals posed by a radio show host who can't get off the graveyard shift Because he only knows about the Beatles and Michael Jordan? You know how old I am, buddy? What are you doing at 19? And of course, any chance I got I talked about Jordan. Dislocated is a, a index finger in the game. I scared the crap out of me. I was I was laying on the ground. I'm like, oh god, he's hurt. He's gone. He's done. Because Michael was like rolling on the floor, <laughs> like in tears, man. He was. Uh, he looked pretty, pretty hurt. Uh, then he comes back and scores 16 in the second quarter, and uh, he's okay. I talked about him so much. Someone finally called and said, you know, you work at a radio station. Just ask for a press pass. So I did. And they gave me one. They gave a teenager a license to dream. And suddenly, this dude's leg would be where I would end up watching an entire game. I pulled out my childhood camera, and it was like my basketball cards came to life.
remembered I had just bought a video camera that day and turned it on. Is he yelling at you? No, but that was when I realized radio guys aren't supposed to sit on the court. And uh, I just tried to hide. So how did you take this then? Basically, I put it in my lap like this. <laughs> it was not fun, but I figured if I just kept my head down, uh, nobody would notice. I got lucky. You can actually see me in the broadcast of the game. The foul is on Steve Kerr. That's his first. The foul is on Steve Kerr. That's his first. As I got settled into the game, I realized I couldn't keep following the ball or the footage was going to be awful. But it was so loud and the players were so close, I was actually scared. It's something you don't feel when you're in the seats, and most definitely not on TV.
is third, team second. That's the coach. He was yelling at the ref the whole game, <laughs> trying to get good calls. I had no idea Phil Jackson was this loud until that moment. Tendy, get out, get out, Tony. Overplay it, get out of here. Overplay it. Angle, angle, Tony, angle. I guess I knew coaches yelled during the game, but this seemed crazy. Oh, and let me shout out John Paxson real quick. When I got my press pass and I saw Jordan enter the locker room, I immediately went in which was apparently the incorrect thing to do, and Jerry Krause lost his mind at me and screamed for me to get out. Now, part of me was honored because he was an infamous jerk that every Bulls fan hated, but while grabbing some food, Paxson came up to me and profusely apologized for his general manager. He was genuinely embarrassed and signed an autograph for me. The man who sealed the three-peat in 93? So cool. But yes, the coaches were non-stop. And the Cavs coach, Mike Fratello, just seemed docile in comparison. gets it the entire game. But they're making him a better player. But they're being mean. They're not being mean, they're just telling him when he's missing his assignments. This is a championship team, man. You can't miss your assignments. Luke wants the coach to tell him that. I think. came out of the game, but the TV didn't cut away, and he basically sat on the couch next to me. In 10 years of watching Bulls games, I never really saw how Jordan interacts on the bench or what happens during timeouts. 
All that crowd noise started to fade, and the wonder of the moment returned. Jordan was all business, but Pippin and Harper were having the time of their lives. Yeah, did you catch that? Pippin not only looked in the camera, but you can also see him thinking, wait, they're letting kids with camcorders on the floor now? Then when Jordan came back in, I instinctively grabbed my childhood camera again. It's hilarious to me that I'm in a row of professional photographers with tens of thousands of dollars of equipment. And here I am with a $50 point and click. But therein lies the magic. These pictures look like my memories.
Wait, Jordan's 23, that's 45, and that's 33. That's Scottie Pippen, and that is Michael Jordan. And they signed them. Yep. Why 45? Uh, that was his comeback number, and it meant the world to them. So I mentioned I was an adult when he came back, but did I mention I was insane? I taped every single game of his comeback season, which meant begging local sports bars to let me record their satellite feeds. I kept a journal documenting every single moment, mostly for my own therapy since I lived in Buckeye country and no one was as fanatical about it as I was. The reason I was so nuts was this overwhelming feeling that I didn't appreciate his first run, and I wasn't going to let that happen again. That's why I went into that locker room with a 45 jersey under my clothes and risked my job to have him sign it. And he wasn't too happy. Is he mad at you? Just disappointed. It was, it was unprofessional. I was supposed to like be working and I shouldn't have asked for an autograph. But You yeah. could have lost your job. Yeah, but I'd only had it for a couple months at that point. And it was Michael Jordan. Uh, yeah, I probably shouldn't have done that. Jordan didn't mince words with me, and I quote, You could lose your stripes for this, dog. And though I didn't have that on tape, when I went back to the locker room after the game, I caught him starting to scold another young reporter doing the same thing. When I got to the hallway, I asked Pippen for his autograph, and he was very cool. And years later, I realized it was quite a famous section of the Gundarina hallway outside the visiting locker room. This is where it all went down. Now, it wasn't my most professional moment, and it kind of hurt that he felt less of me, but hey, he was kind enough to sign my jersey, and 25 years later, it's a family heirloom. Now, there's a school of thought that we all need to put down our cameras and just take in the moment as things are happening. And I did indeed find myself so in awe that I just watched as a fan. But I have to say, I have no memory of the game during these moments. 25 years later, these images are my memory, and I presume in another 25 years, I may find it hard to believe this even happened. So, although I'm glad I took a few moments to just soak it in, I'm happier that those moments were few and far between. Because that's Michael Jordan walking towards me. As the first half neared the end, I finally started to concentrate on the game itself and not just the sights and sounds. I hadn't really paid attention to how Jordan was doing until this moment. When I look back over my footage and pictures, I realized this fan had been messing with Jordan during the entire game, including pre-game warm-ups. And then you see the broadcast and he would stand up. I mean, he's an arm's length away from Pippen when he stands. And if you listen closely, he'd been yelling well before the shoes line. I guess he's talking about Marley here, but if you know Jordan, he's certainly not leaving Marley alone. He infamously liked torturing him when he was on the Suns. 
Now, Jordan was having a quiet first half with only six points in the first quarter and zero in the second, only attempting one shot. He really didn't seem very engaged, and to be fair, Bobby Phils was a really great defender. 24 seconds to shoot. Sadly, he died in a car crash a little over four years after this. Such a shock. And Jordan wasn't the only guy getting screamed at. Rodman was out with an injury, and Pippen was picking up his slack, which brought the heckler's wrath on him. Foul on number nine, Dan Marley. That's his first. Team first, Scotty Pippen at the line. One shot. And he is lucky he didn't get that ball thrown right back at him. And then Jordan fouls Brandon. And that's when the heckler takes it one step too far. special pairs of shoes. You guys know about the first one. These are the Nike mags. And these are not the crappy ones I keep in the time machine. These are the real ones. And the other pair of special shoes that I own are those ugly Concord 11s, which are actually the most famous Jordan shoes ever. Aren't those awesome? Whoa. Yeah. And they have the special 45 on the back. Of all the shoes this man could have made fun of, he chose the holy grail of Air Jordans. The most sought after, most celebrated Jordans. The Jordans you can wear to church. Your grandmama says, look nice for Jesus, put on your Concord 11s. Jordan wears these to weddings in a tuxedo for crying out loud. The literal height of fashion. Then again, this dude's struggling in that area. I mean, I almost hate to immortalize him forever in film, but once you see how all this plays out, you'll understand. Would you like to wear them? Unfortunately, I can't wear them. Why? These are dead stock. That means they've never been worn, never been touched worth like over $500. Over like this, $500. yeah. So you, you don't wear these. What's the point of owning a pair of shoes if you don't even wear them? Um, that's a good point. Uh, I have no idea. Anyway, let's watch how he deals with this heck. Cavs ball. 1.8 seconds remaining. Here we go. So that ended the half, and during halftime, the Cavs premiered their new mascot, Whammer. I 
wish I could tell you this gets better. But this is still eight years before they got LeBron. And, well, Cleveland's gonna Cleveland. come back and I decided to try out the snapshot feature a bit during warm-ups. tell you how happy I am that I realized this was awful before I ruined any important shots. Foul on 44, Michael Cage. That's his first, team first. So Jordan starts to get more involved. And not just in scoring. Jordan and Phil were masters of planting seeds throughout a game to get calls later on. And literally the very next play after this timeout. Of course, the kid in me is thrilled as my Jordan at the line picture meant so much to me when I took it, and now I was actually filming him at the line. And these were the only two free throws he shot the entire game, which I thought was going to be a problem for them because the Cavs were stepping up. And unfortunately, some of Jordan's teammates were not. This may have made the heckler pretty happy, but it made Jordan and Pippen take over. Yeah. 
Wait, you gotta see this. You gotta see this. Alright, see this basketball card? That it was taken right at that moment. See, this is what this video would have looked like if I had a real camera. <laughs> timeout, Cleveland. Cavaliers, 20 second timeout. Oh, and on the subject of Pippen, with these free throws, he had a triple double in the third quarter, ending up with 18, 13, and 12. I feel like he gets dismissed because Jordan's light was so bright, but at the time, we all felt Scotty was the second best player in the league, not just this team. He did everything and was the best support system for a pure scorer like Jordan that there's ever been. And then with Rodman simply wanting to rebound and give it to others to score, I mean, that team was a perfect storm managed by a brilliant coach. What a thing to witness. John Bushler, Michael Jordan, back for Chicago. So Jordan comes back in, giving Scotty a rest, and the fan is still John. when Jordan is disappointed with you. I know how you feel, Ku Coach. Made that fan happy, though. All of this leading to one of the most memorable answers to a heckler I've ever seen. Now, at this point, I still wasn't sure if Jordan heard all of this or if he was just so in the moment he blocked it out. After this shot to go up 16, however, I got my answer. He literally points at him and yells right back. I've slowed this down as much as possible because I'm dying to know what he said, and the only part I can make out is, keep talking, keep talking, keep talking. And the fan does. He gets right back in his face. Dude is uncomfortably close to Jordan here, and I'm actually stunned the ref didn't talk to him. But after this, MJ knew the game was sealed and he was in good spirits. 
It was the only time I saw him smile the whole game. Chris Mills on the line, but plus the penalty for two. Cavs were still scrapping though. But it made little difference as MJ gets his 23rd point of the half. goes to the bench, and you see him look over at the fan who is still talking. And realize at the time, I couldn't see his face when he was jawing the fan. Oh, but I saw this. Two minutes, less than two minutes remaining fourth quarter. I couldn't believe I was capturing this and zoomed over to see his reaction. Listen, I know Jordan's infamous about taking things personal, but it still blows my mind he would take something personal from someone so inconsequential. But years later, I looked him up, and his name was Eddie Nara, and he was infamous for this. The heckler. Every Cavs player knew him, and he'd always show up to big games with a courtside seat and berate the opposing team. He did the same at college and high school games, and rumor has it he did this at a hockey game and a Buffalo player clocked him in the eye. And what seems especially cruel is he died in 2002, the year before the Cavs got LeBron. So we never got to see him win it. But thank you, Eddie, because you created an indelible memory for me, and now countless people get to see Jordan spar with you. I'm thrilled I was able to put this together and immortalize your devotion. But yeah, shut up, dude. I'm gonna go play basketball. Okay. And then I got to go back into the locker room after the game. Saving it all up for the second half? <laughs> Two halves to a game. First half, I was. You know, I really wasn't in the game that much, so I felt a little rested in the second half. I know they rotate and double a lot on defense. But were you surprised they're leaving you open so much on the three-point line? I don't think they could find me. Second half, I was more at the top, you know, and then or before I was in the post, and they were double teaming me, and then it was easy for them to stay on me. And then when I got out of the post and was able to move around a little bit, it made it tough for them to try to keep an eye on me. But uh, in the post, the first half, they did. Good job getting the ball out of my hands. Michael, that run at the end of the third quarter into the that kind of really separated you guys tonight really kind of took off after that. Well, I think in the second half, we really had a couple good stretches down there throughout the second half, and then we were able to uh, just separate ourselves from them. You know, rebounding wise, open court, you know, we were able to get some penetration to the defense. and. Uh, you know, really put some pressure on us. And nice bench help tonight too, didn't you? Yeah, uh, everyone contributed off the bench. I mean, uh, <coughs> Steve Kerr came in and gave us some good minutes. I think Judge Boosler came in. Nicky Simpson stepped in the starting line and gave us some good minutes. So uh, I think that's, that's, that's a good sign for this team to be able to expand your roles when 
if one player is not in the game, it might you know, be very productive. Can you feel anything this early about this team? Like, I mean, it's still very early in the season about where this team is going at, at this point. Well, I, I think, as you see, we've learned how to expand our role in situations like that. So that's a good sign. Defensively, we've shown great signs where we can clamp down teams and, and make a difference between them and us. So we've shown good signs. Are we where we want to be now? You know, we to go and, you know, I, I think we have to do that consistently throughout the game. Wait, how about Bobby Phillips? He's, uh, he seems like he's kind of playing you better and better. So the time is going on. Can you comment on that? Well, I think uh, you know the difference between him and, and Elo or whatever. You know, Elo in the time that I was playing here in Cleveland, they never doubled him. Here, he knows he's got double team coming, so uh, you know, he plays pretty sturdy and very solid in the post and wherever. Second half, I was able to get him in the open court situation where I could get him quicker. So yeah, I'll double team. So I debated whether to mention this, but considering you can literally see Scotty trying to put his pants on, and mind you, I'm not the only camera rolling, it bears mentioning. Post-game locker room interviews are insane. And in the 90s, it became a massive debate after the Zeke Mohad incident. Everyone wanted to focus on female reporters in the locker room, but the truth is, none of us should be in the locker room. Before this, Scotty came out in just a towel, and a female reporter and I saw way, way, way more than we should have and promptly turned our heads out of respect. It was wildly uncomfortable, but the only way any of us could do our job. 25 years later, this is somehow still a thing, and I'll never understand it. For bigger games, they simply set up a press conference and the players come there after they're dressed for a controlled question and answer period. And now because of COVID, I have to wonder if the days of locker room interviews are going to be a thing of the past once athletes get used to not being forced into corners and grilled before even getting dressed. It's a wildly unnecessary relic of the past. Hopefully. Pippen picked up the rebounding slot with uh, Rodman here at 13 tonight. Is he a better rebounder now than when you were playing before, or is it just the fact that you had other rebounders back then? We had other rebounders back then. I think uh, he didn't really have to do it as often with, with Horace and with Bill. You know, I think uh, you know, he's, he's been able to always expand his role, and uh, I think that's, that's a sign of greatness for him. And, uh, tonight he expanded his, you know, uh, in the rebounding area and certainly in the assist area. Michael, when, when you don't have a first half, it's uh, a good one. Do you just say to yourself at halftime or some point in the second half, like, no matter, no worry, I'll, you know, I'll get hot in the second half. Well, I just, I mean, even when, I, when I'm in the first half, I mean, I only had eight shots and uh, I was still within the game. I just had to figure out a way to, to attack the defense or to get myself within the rhythm of the, uh, of the game. And I was able to do that in the second half with the three-point shooting, which extended the defense a little bit more. I was able to get some isolation. This team, your team, seems like they've reloaded. You guys are ready to go for another run this year. For the Cavs, they've almost hit. You know, they they got to start all over. I mean, is it seeing them this year and seeing Mark Price gone, John Williams? I mean, your comments on their team as a whole. It's a different look. Uh, through injuries, through trades, through retirement. I mean, uh, they certainly not the Cavs from four years ago. But they got a good solid base with Mills and Phils and uh, Bob Sir and. Brandon, I think now they can start building uh, from inside and uh, extend themselves a little bit better. But uh, they've, made, they've made some unbelievable changes. And, uh, now I think they're, they're, they're trying to build things back up. And, uh, it may take some time. Thanks a lot. The whole conference this, uh, this year seems to be very competitive. Uh, Indiana and uh, Atlanta, your thoughts on that? Let me talk. Well, Atlanta's dealing with the loss of Shaq, and <coughs> Indiana's. Uh, Without a couple of players, so uh, you know, they got to make some adjustments here and there whenever those people come back. But you can believe those are going to be the teams to beat in, in the East. Thanks. Mike, thanks a lot. Good luck to you. Rest of the season. Hey, Melina told me too. Melina Cunningham? Yeah. How's she doing? She's doing fine. She should be up here the next couple of weeks. Is she? Yeah. Is she moving up here? Yeah. Oh, she's where? She comes to see Langham sometimes. Oh, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> Tell her I see what's happening. Okay. Good girl. Told me All right. All right. Once I saw Jordan in a good mood, I knew it was my chance to ask a question. Mike, now that you're like, you're 4 0, do you think 66 more to go to get to the, the 70 mark? Or is that even on your mind now? Just take it game by game. I don't think we're in a rush to, to get to 70. We just got a lot of time in between and uh, a lot of things to learn in between. So take it game, game by game. I have now regretted not asking Jordan about the heckler for longer than I was alive at that point. 
it would have been the perfect button to this story. But you have to realize I didn't understand the extent of the heckler until after I watched my footage. I only saw the shh and the fan laughing. The idea of a team winning 70 in one season was a much bigger deal and it had never happened. But 25 years later, of course they ended up winning 70 and winning everything for the next three years. And the standout thing that I captured that day ended up being this side story about Jordan's remarkable ability to turn anything into motivation. So it was no secret that with the addition of Rodman, this team was going to be so good they could eclipse the all-time record of 69-13. and 13. But at this point, considering it was Game 4, no one had actually asked him. So I got to be the first idiot to do so. I'm kind of proud of that. I'm glad it's cemented into NBA history. All right. Now that you're like you're four and zero, do you think 66 more to go to get to the the 70 mark, or is that even on your mind now? Just take it game by game. I don't think we're in a rush to to get to 70. We just got a lot of time in between and uh, a lot of things to learn in between. So take it game by game by game. That was my day with Michael Jordan. Can I go beat Cam at basketball? I would love that. My relationship with the NBA after Jordan changed forever when in January of 2000 I finally moved to an NBA city, Los Angeles. And yes, that means I once again lucked into following greatness as Shaq, Kobe, and the Lakers won the championship the first three years I lived here. And a decade later, Kobe and Powell won it back to back. Of course, I had to watch their first championship on a webcam in the middle of the night from Paris but you gotta support your team. Now I still rep MJ, you can't forget your roots. But I've lived in LA for over 20 years now, and it's my home. In 2010, YouTube moved their time limit from 10 minutes to 15 minutes, which meant I could finally upload the original short I made about meeting Michael in 1995 which really did just sit in my closet for 15 years. The amazing thing about the short was that it had to be edited live, meaning I had two VCRs, a mixer, a CD player, and a microphone. And I got one take to pull off the entire thing. And I had to factor in the time it took to switch out CDs while reading my script. You screw up, you start over, 15 straight minutes. Might be my proudest editing achievement to date, and I did all that work just to show it to four or five people back then. Crazy. Also crazy was watching it go viral. I mean, when you wake up one morning and the Washington Post has written a story on it, kind of hard to process. And although BroBible.com isn't exactly the Washington Post, they included it as part of their top 10 Jordan trash-talking moments of all time. And it audibly made me gasp. To think that I somehow added something to Jordan's legacy with my footage that wouldn't have existed otherwise, it kind of boggles the mind. Also mind-boggling is having kids and having one that is basketball crazy. To the point of it being the dangling carrot that made him walk. Oh, there's five steps. Yeah. As well as being his first word. Basketball! Too young to take him to games, but I was lucky enough to score some player tickets and meet some stars. I even hung out with Charles Barkley. Thanks to my friend Mo Kelly literally calling me and saying, Do you want to hang out with Charles Barkley? The man, the myth, Sir Charles. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Charles has to be one of the nicest people I've ever met. Got to watch Kobe's last game with my kid. Bye, bye, bye. You want to you go to bed? No. Do you want to watch Kobe Bryant's last game? Yes. Uh, okay, that's what we're going to do. <laughs> and a few months later, 
watch the team I felt sorry for my whole life finally get a chip. Boy, did Cleveland deserve it. And you may be wondering if I ever got to see a basketball game from up close again. And, well, I did. And I brought a good camera with me. What's crazy is I had brought pretty good cameras with pretty good seats before. But location is everything, and 10th row center gets you this. Goodness, is this not breathtaking? Oh, to have had this technology in 1995. Then again, that's what makes what I was able to capture back then so special. But to be in this section, I mean, you're next to the NBA commissioner. Magic Johnson comes up to say hi. I mean, other than this not being my childhood hero, this felt a lot like 1995. Oh! <laughs> Having a player from the 90s still playing also helped that feeling. Then sanity, what can't this man do? Even got a Hollywood ending with LeBron getting the game winner. Tyson Chandler sealing it with a block. Now, this is a Laker town, and I am absolutely a Laker fan. But the economic reality is, if you're a family of four, you're taking them to a Clippers game first. Which Cam ended up loving, so I surprised him with some better seats. The last NBA game I saw had the best ending I've ever seen live. And then, of course, a few months later, our city had our hearts broken. And did you see this? Oops. What? About Kobe? What? He died in a helicopter crash? I was lucky enough to be shooting a commercial for my DeLorean in Kobe's neighborhood and met him at this Starbucks. I made him laugh bragging about my car, which he appreciated. His life after basketball was far more inspirational to me since we shared a mutual love for filmmaking and storytelling, as well as an obvious devotion to our children. I just knew I'd get to work with him someday. And wouldn't you know, of all the people to break down on that stage, Jordan wrecked me in a way I didn't know was possible. Already crushed, I wept like a little boy watching my hero in pain. And it was a reminder to appreciate every moment. Smell the flowers, eat the cake, and wear the shoes. Jordan ignited my passion for the game of basketball. But these comparison arguments have to stop. LeBron is unbelievable and has kept it up for nearly 20 years. Enjoy it. KD is amazing. Steph is amazing. Harden, Westbrook, Luka, Giannis. We have to stop trying to find every way they're not as good as Jordan while conveniently forgetting his flaws and just enjoy the game of basketball.
cheer for everyone to be their best. Isn't that what we teach our kids? Work hard, learn the fundamentals, keep pushing, and be the best you can. Hating on players that are winning now or undermining their achievements belittles the game. The game is great, and tomorrow is not guaranteed. You could have lost your job, like, you could have lost your job. Yes, all right, try it again. Was he mad at you? I uh, just disappointed. It's unprofessional. You know, I could have lost my job. You could have lost your job? Yeah, weren't you gonna say it differently? You, oh, I, uh, all right, I won't say it. You say it, you could have lost your job. All right, you, go ahead. You said it, so I had I, to say a question right. mark. Yeah, I know, okay, so, <laughs> my bad. <laughs> I the go, you ready? And go, don't look at the camera, go. Was he mad at you? Yeah, just disappointed. It was unprofessional. I was supposed to be working, not asking for autographs. You could have lost your job. I, yeah, I could have. Um, I was Mike. It was Michael Jordan, dude. I don't know what to tell you. I did. I risked my job to get that autograph, but I didn't lose my job. You're mad at me? Like I did something wrong? I'm sorry. Um, you took his jersey. No, 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 no. That was my jersey. I had it on under my shirt. I didn't take his jersey, dude. I just had, I, I, I took my shirt out and I was like, yo, can you sign this? And he's like, you could lose your stripes for this. He was a little disappointed in me. But I hope you understand now, Michael. <laughs>